I now address the uh, topic of the good news of the gospel in the world of the occult and of spirits. We have talked considerably in our previous sessions about the occultic powers rooted in the mana concept and so forth, and also spiritual powers, and like ancestral spirits or nature spirits and so forth. And um, these powers are, uh, are, are, very, are very frightful. Uh, they, um, they, they can do great damage. And uh, much of the energies in societies which are profoundly influenced by occultic powers, much of the energies of those societies go into attempting to work at developing uh, peace uh, for relationships in the face of these powers who can be so very, very destructive. And that takes experts, it takes shamans, it takes whatnot and whatnot to try to deal with these powers. You need spiritual experts to, to work at manipulating them and controlling them in, uh, in appropriate ways. I think of uh, visiting West Kalimantan some years ago in Indonesia. West Kalimantan, one of the Indonesian islands, which uh, is heavily forested. And um, one of the church communities in uh, Java uh, was serving uh, development work and church formation and so forth in a remote area of West Kalimantan and invited me to travel with them to that region on one occasion. You fly in in a little airplane and then you travel from village to village on boats um, because they have no highways. In fact, they will say, how big is the river going past your house in America? Because they can't quite conceive of highways with vehicles and so forth. Boat travel is the way they travel. And so we went on a day's boat ride, stopping at different villages, up, uh, up uh, in different villages along the river, and finally came to the village we were going to spend the night in. And uh, every house was up on stilts because it floods a lot, and so the stilts would hold the house up above the waters. The house we stayed in, uh, the water was about this far from the, uh, from the uh, floor, uh, although it was up on stilts, the water was quite high. And as I tried to sleep that night, there was a frog under my ear uh, in the water just beneath the floor where I was sleeping. And so occasionally through the night, just walk, walk, walk of a frog under my ear. And so the next morning then, we walk out to the clinic, which the uh, little Christian community had begun. In fact, that whole village had become Christian in the last year or so. And so uh, we went to this clinic, and uh, the little boys and girls are walking along with us with their big umbrella hats because it was raining just a bit. The hats were about that big round, um, rather comical, I must say, bigger round than the little children were tall. Um, and so we come to this clinic, and soon the chief appears. And so I ask him a question, which as I have mentioned earlier, I often ask, why have you become a Christian? Why has your village become Christian? What is it about the gospel that you have found to be good news? He had a red beard, and so he stroked his red beard like this, and then very solemnly he said, we are not afraid of the birds anymore. We just pray and plan and go about our work. It's much, it's much easier being a chief. Now, what did he mean? We talked about worldview earlier in this class. What is worldview? Worldview explains what we're here for, where we are headed, and how we can find forgiveness. All of that is included. Worldview explains our relationship to nature and to creation. So when he says we're not afraid of the birds anymore, he was speaking from his worldview. What was frightful about the birds before he became a Christian? Ah, 
they were an autocratic society that we have talked about, who believed that all of nature is permeated with spirits and with nature gods. And in this tribe, they believed that the birds are the messengers of the gods. So, if you would go and you were going to harvest your rice, and these birds would start to squawk, walk, 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 you would know that this is a messenger from the gods telling you that the gods are mad, they're angry at you. So you would have to stop harvesting the rice, go back to the village, and spend the rest of the day offering a pig as a sacrifice to these birds that are squawking. So you go out to harvest the rice the next day. And alas, as you're harvesting, these birds start to squawk again. Quack, quack. So you know the gods are still mad. So you go back to the village and you offer another pig as a sacrifice. What if on the third day they're still squawking? Well, 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 well. The elders determine that this calls for the ultimate sacrifice. And so their young warriors will go to a nearby village and they will hide in the bushes and they will look for the man with the most handsome head in that village. Which of you men would have the most handsome head? You? You? The most handsome head. They would look for the man with the most handsome head. They would jump out from behind the bushes and grab him and cut off his head. And then they would put that head on a pole and they would say, Gods, the gods, hear us. We have now made the ultimate sacrifice. This head on a pole, we can do no more than this. We implore you, be at peace with us and stop this squawking. We need to bring the rice in. The ultimate sacrifice is made. Now, when that chief and that village heard the gospel, what did they hear? Why did he say that it's much easier being a chief now since we have accepted Jesus? What does he mean by that? Ah, uh, Jesus was also put on a pole wasn't he? Just as they put the most handsome warrior in the clan on a pole. Jesus was put on a pole on a cross. He is the best head, the finest, the most perfect head either God or humanity could provide. And on that cross, he is on a cross on a hill. Golgotha is a hill. Jesus is put on a cross on a hill. Remember, we said earlier on that it's the hills that the ancient Canaanites would worship the gods at because they believed that the, that the fertility gods clustered around the hills. The hills represented pregnancy, the pregnant womb, you see. And so these divinities of fertility would cluster on those hills. Jesus is put on a cross on a hill. What does that mean? It means that the gods, he is placed on the hill where the gods reside, where the gods dominate. And so it's not only humanity that coalesces around Jesus and puts him on that cross. It's also the gods and the spirits, all those autocratic powers that we talked about the other day. They all converge on Jesus on that cross, you see. So here's the most excellent head that heaven or earth could provide. And he's put on a cross in the midst of all the gods of nature that are in rebellion against the Creator God. What does he do? In his death and resurrection, he breaks the power of the gods. In fact, we read in the scriptures that in his death, he not only breaks the powers of the gods, the ancestral gods, uh, uh, the nature gods, 
but he goes into the realm of the ancestors also, and he also triumphs over them. So both the ancestors and the nature gods are triumphed over by Jesus in his crucifixion and his resurrection. When he died, the nature gods believed, we got him. Because the nature gods are in rebellion against God, the creator. When Jesus died, they got him. We got him on that hill, on that tree. There he is, dead. But he rose from the dead. He broke the powers of these nature gods and the powers of the ancestral gods as well. It's phenomenal. And so this chief said, it is much easier being a chief now because Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He has broken the power of the ancestral gods and of the nature gods. He's broken their power. He's triumphed over them. And so we just hear the birds squawking now and we say, go ahead, squawk all you want to. You're not the boss anymore. Jesus is our boss. And he has conquered all of you gods that the birds are squawking about. Go ahead, do your squawking, but, but we, we, uh, we are, uh, we're free. We're free from you. And so he said, we just pray and plan and we go about our work. It's so much easier being a chief now. Now, what that chief was sharing, you will hear all around the world, wherever the gospel goes in relationship to the occultic powers, which some of you were asking about, and the powers of nature and the nature gods and the ancestral gods. Christ has triumphed over them. He breaks those powers. I mentioned to you the other day that where I grew up in East Africa, every homestead, with no exception, had a thorn hedge around the homestead. You go there today, the thorn hedges are gone. They're not there anymore at all. Why? Many reasons, but certainly one reason is the conviction that Christ has triumphed over the nature powers, over the spirits of the ancestors and so forth, so you don't need fences to keep them out anymore because Jesus has triumphed over them. There where I grew up, I mentioned to you the other day how that uh, Jonah and my father cut down some trees in a grove. Now, I think my earliest recollection of anything, and I was about two years old, I remember this like yesterday, women coming to our house after those trees were cut down, and they had their gourds and their ankle bells and their pouches to represent occultic power tied to their arms and necks and so forth, around their necks and so forth. This group of women, probably about a dozen of them, came to our house and they danced around our house with their ch ch ch, -ch these gourds. What were they doing? They were cursing our family. That's what they were doing. They were cursing our family. And we learned later that they had already dug the graves to bury my parents in and to bury Joan Atini in, the Zanaki man who was working with my dad. The graves stayed open. No one died. And the whole tribe said, wow, Jesus has broken the power of the occultic curses we had put on that missionary team. The whole, the whole tribe knew that, from one end of the tribe to the other, that Jesus had conquered the curse. Because in the traditional religion, they said, when we put this kind of curse on somebody, they always died. But the missionary team and Jonah lived, broke the power. And sometime later, one of those women who was involved in that event came to church one Sunday morning with a basket filled with occultic stuff. A whole basket full of this occultic stuff. She brought it to church. What's she doing bringing occultic stuff to church? What's she doing? What's going on? This is what was going on. In that church service, she stood up, she said, that day when the grave stayed open, she knew that Christ has triumphed over these occultic powers. 
And so she has determined she wants nothing more to do with them. And so the whole congregation sang praises to Jesus and they went outside the church building with all those occultic paraphernalia she had in her basket and they burnt it up as they sang praises to Jesus who is triumphant over the occultic powers. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.